Эстетика в разрезе с Ольгой Засеевой. Эрик Санта-Мария, доктор медицины, профессор реконструктивной микрохирургии, отделение пластической и реконструктивной хирургии Национального автономного университета Мексики. Эрик, so nice to see you again in four years, again in Moscow. Thank you very much for coming because it's for us it's a big honor to have you as a speaker. The, the last time we didn't have time to, to make an interview, so this time I want to squeeze you for many information. And the most important for me, because it's only one plastic and reconstructive surgeon from Mexico I know. <laughs> so tell, tell us please, how it does look like the plastic and reconstructive surgery in your country? First of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here again in this beautiful country and in this very important meeting. I would like to say that probably a lot of people don't know about the position of Mexico in terms of uh, the number of cases that we do. But indeed, we are the fourth largest society of plastic surgeons in the world. Oh, how many? It's uh, already 2,500. So after the US, Brazil, and I think somewhere in like India or another country, we are like the fourth largest society in the, in the world. And we, adult, we do a lot of uh, cosmetic and reconstructive surgery in our country. Excellent. And what is the most popular uh, procedure? In terms of cosmetic surgery, number one is liposuction, followed by rhinoplasty, mm -hmm. and then breast enlargement. Okay. And what about reconstruction? Reconstruction, we do a lot of uh, breast reconstruction, but also head and neck, lower extremity mm -hmm. for trauma cases. So I would say that the, the training of our residents and myself is very complete. We have to do three years in general surgery and then three or four years in plastic surgery. And what about the microsurgery? Because microsurgery is a part of the plastic surgery. Is it also popular or, I mean, uh, yeah. re requests in Mexico because it's quite expensive? Reconstructive microsurgery has evolved significantly in the last two decades not only in Mexico, but in, in, the, in the whole world. But we need to do this kind of surgery because we have a lot of cancer patients, trauma patients, congenital deformities mm -hmm. that require reconstructive surgery using microsurgical techniques. Microsurgery is not a subspecialty only of plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. It is part of other specialties like head and neck, orthopedic surgery, but only those who are trained in reconstructive microsurgery can offer patients this kind of reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So we do have a dual system uh, in our practice because on, at some time we have to work for the public hospital and do this kind of surgery to the patient who has no possibilities of having private surgery. But on the other hand, we also can offer this kind of surgery to patients who are covered by insurance companies. Mm. So we make a living out of that. I can tell you that most of my living is out of doing reconstructive surgery and mostly reconstructive microsurgery because I trained on these kind of procedures abroad for three mm. years. Then I went back to my country almost 25 years ago and I developed all these kind of subspecialty and I have a fellowship program where I have trained more than 100 fellows Already from Mexico. From, from all, they come from all over the world, but mostly from South America, mm -hmm. Spain, Italy, and even from the U.S. Mm -hmm. to do a one-year fellowship under my tutelage. Estetica в разрезе. In terms of education, are you more close to the American system or are you more close to the European system or it's something unique no. and in, more or less independent? No, we are more, we are closer to the American system because uh, we follow many of the um, training programs that they have. And for instance, in, in Latin America, we are the only country where our plastic surgeons need to be board certified. Oh. After they complete their training, they need to present a final exam and to, to be board certified, which is the same that they do in the US. And what does it mean, board certifies? It's, it's it, independent board? Yes. Or it's, uh... yes. This, this is a, 
a, a, a plastic and reconstructive surgery board that um, allows you to be certified once you have completed all your training, then you become board eligible, and then you can present this exam. And in order to practice plastic and reconstructive mm -hmm. surgery in my country, you need to be board certified. That, in that way, you can work like in the best hospitals, both in public and private system, and you also are covered by the insurance companies. If you are not board certified, the insurance companies do not allow you to practice. Unfortunately, like in many other countries, we have a lot of um, mm, people that are not really specialists. Mm -hmm. They do aesthetic surgery or the aesthetic proced cosmetic procedures but they are not real plastic surgeons. And this has become a problem all over the world, as you probably know. Yeah, so in, in, case, in case I'm a plastic surgeon, so if I will not uh, pass this exam, I couldn't, can't be, I can't have a practice, or exactly. I can? You, you can, but it will be illegal. Okay. And, and you won't be allowed to work in the best hospitals mm -hmm. or to be recruited to work in a public hospital. Mm -hmm. And the insurance companies will not cover you for doing these kind of surgeries. Yeah, it's very smart actually, it's very smart. Yes. But is it difficult to pass the exam? Did no, you, How no. many did you cancel, let's say, not pass? I was president of the Mexican Board of Plastic and Reconstructive mm -hmm. Surgery 10 years ago, and I can tell you that five to 10% of the trainees, mm -hmm. they fail, and they have to present the next year. So they're allowed to? Yes, to yes. How many times Only they three times. Only three times. Only three times, yeah. So, okay, it's, yeah. it's interesting. I think the system works because mm -hmm. it's the only way you can really control the practice and the continuous medical education of all the plastic surgeons. Mm -hmm. Because you need to be, again, recertified every five years mm -hmm. by attending meetings, by giving lectures, by proving that you are into continuous medical education. Do you have any limitation of the number of the plastic surgeons? Well, we have only 13 programs in my country, mm -hmm. which is a 120 million population. But every year we graduate between 70 and 80 plastic surgeons. Mm -hmm. And that's enough, you think it's this, enough? From these 13 programs, mm -hmm. yes. You can go abroad and you, you're training, and then you go back to Mexico and you can be also board certified. Mm -hmm. If this program is on the university system, and it's uh, recognized mm -hmm. by our board, uh, plastic surgery board. Aesthetica в разрезе. Life has already have been changed. What do you think will be the next five years, um, let's say, improvement or changing in a plastic and reconstructive surgery? Well, I think there are many different um, fields or subspecialties that continue growing. One of them is, of course, reconstructive micro surgery. We are doing a lot of programs with new microscopes, with new, with new um, um, supplies to do better surgery. All this imaging technology that is uh, becoming more popular will help us to do a better preparative planning and intraoperative mm -hmm. assessment of our free flaps mm -hmm. and also for the postoperative monitoring of our free flaps. All of this has you know, improved a lot in the last five, 10 years. And I think it will continue mm -hmm. improving and we will find new applications for doing more and more uh, surgeries using reconstructive microsurgery. In terms of cosmetic surgery, I think that there is a tendency to reduce the number of surgeries that we do and probably have more uh, non-invasive procedures mm -hmm. to improve our outcomes, like all this if lipofilling or even even Botox and yeah. uh, you know fillers, mm -hmm. all of these kind of procedures are replacing surgery on one ex on one on one on one uh, percentage. But still, surgery is indicated to improve you know aging, like facelift, blepharoplasty, mm -hmm. uh, and I think all of these will continue evolving and offer better better options for our patients. So reimbursement uh, pays for the breast reconstruction? The system doesn't, is it worse, reimbursement by, by government or it's... Uh, well, if, if in, the, in the public hospital, you, you don't charge for doing one or 100 cases per month. Mm -hmm. But in private practice, definitely you charge mm -hmm. to the insurance company for doing this kind of surgery. People choose. 
People choose if they would like to do it in a public hospital or they would like to do it in a private. It, sometimes it's not a matter of choosing. It depends on your social level. Mm -hmm. Because if you can afford having a private insurance company, mm -hmm. you won't go to the public hospital to mm -hmm. receive this kind of medical attention. You will go directly into a private hospital. Mm -hmm. But the ones who does this kind of surgery are people like me, for instance, the ones who also work in a public hospital to have a name, to mm -hmm. have, a, you know, to people know that you are an experienced surgeon. And of mm -hmm. course, in private practice, you won't do that many cases like you do, like in the National Institute of Cancerology, mm -hmm. where we have at least, at least between five and 600 mastectomies per year. Mm -hmm. And in the public hospital, only 20% of these patients will receive a breast reconstruction. Why? Why only 20? Because they don't want the... Because, because well, mm -hmm. there are many reasons. Number one, some of these patients already have an advanced disease. So you need to be a little bit selective. Mm -hmm. Because you're not going to offer an immediate reconstruction to a patient mm -hmm. who is on stage 4 breast cancer. And they receive, need to receive chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and all of that. Second, if you offer reconstructive surgery to all patients, you will stop treating breast cancer in some patients. The numbers, the number of patients are a lot. So it's very difficult to cover all of them for both mastectomy and reconstruction. And the last one is that the resources in the government hospital are, are not that much sometimes. Oh, okay. So that's the reason why you need to select the patients more specifically. Aesthetica в разрезе. So in your practice, is it 50-50, 50, 50, 50 reconstruction, 50 aesthetic? No, I'm, I can tell you I'm very lucky because my practice is probably like 60-65% reconstructive surgery and only like 35% mm. cosmetic. And I say very lucky because patients who receive like a breast reconstruction, they are always very grateful more than cosmetic patients. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. May I ask you, what is the, uh, let's say, most popular, most favorite size of the breast for the aesthetic breast surgery in Mexico? Well, Do we, we have, have special we, we, national, we have, national. No, no, that's a very good question. You know, we have a lot of American influence. So mm -hmm. women usually follow like the California style. style. <laughs> so they like big breast. Mm -hmm. So the um, average size of our implants is around 300. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That, talking about the general population, of course, you need to individualize each case. Mm -hmm. For instance, in my practice, I also see a lot of um, ladies that are already like in their 40s, 50s, mm -hmm. and, and they don't really want to have like large implants. They are more into a high level, social level. Mm -hmm. So they want natural outcomes. They don't want to look like having silicones. Yeah. So they only have like 260, 290 cc implants. To look more natural. Yes, to look more natural, exactly. So that's depend from the... Yeah, but in general terms, mm -hmm. our women, like the teenagers, yeah. the, the ones who go for breast enlargement, mm -hmm. they want big breasts. Эстетика в разрезе с Ольгой Засиевой.